So God's sovereign. We know he's in control, but this virus has been pesky, you know. And all of us hate it for one reason or another. And so let's just keep everyone in prayer. We're looking tonight at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. There are only two parables in the Bible which are explained. Now, we're studying the parables of Jesus. There are other parables in the Bible. Uh, we know Nathan told one when he confronted David who had sinned. He told him a parable. There are several, quite a few Old Testament parables. But there are only two New Testament parables that Jesus told, which he also interpreted. The others we have to interpret, but the, this tonight, the parable of the sower, is interpreted in the text. And so we'll try and point out some things that are helpful, for, helpful to you. We're in chapter 13. And tonight we'll read just one verse. We're going to study the first nine verses, but we're going to read verse 11. So if you want to stand with me tonight, stretch your legs a little, because I may put you to sleep momentarily. He, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. They had asked in the previous verse, Why are you speaking? Why are you telling us these made-up stories, these parables? The word para means to throw alongside of. So Jesus would take a story that wasn't true, and then he'd throw truth next to it. The word para is a word you're familiar with. You know what a parachute is? It's something that goes next to you, close to you. One of the words for the Holy Spirit is parakletos. He's right next to us. In fact, now he's in us, isn't he? All right, God bless us. Thank you for your word. Speak to hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. This parable will be explained momentarily, but Matthew, remember, was the tax collector, hated by the Jews, hated by uh, people because he collected money for the Romans, probably siphoned some off the top. They were known for that. But when he became a Christian, he had a big banquet for all his friends and had Jesus come to his house. And not many people have done that. What a great way to reach out to folks. But Matthew is the writer of this parable. He's the inspired writer. And of course, all scripture is given by inspiration. So even if, it's not, if they're not Jesus' words, they're still inspired, right? But here, here Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 13. It starts out the same day when Jesus was out of the house and sat by the sea. So now he's sitting down. Think of Jesus. We, we hear people talk a lot about styles of preaching and so forth. And I've heard people say, you know, we don't need teachers. And that's so dumb to say that because Jesus was a rabbi. <laughs> and uh, Jesus, we don't find ever in scripture where he's screaming and hollering and jumping up on pews. We find him sitting down sometimes and teaching. Sometimes he would teach when they up the, up the room, upper room in John 13, he's walking along. And he's using one object lesson after another. He passes some vines and he talks about being the vine and them being the branches. And he does that all through scripture, uses object lessons. But here he's now sitting down. And he's, he's going to tell a whole bunch of parables today. Uh, these parables, um, these particular parables are given so we recognize uh, the opposition of the devil. He told eight on this day, eight parables. And we're going to learn about the devil. Now, the Sea of Galilee was a place really for average people. You had peasants there, farmers, fishermen. It's not a place where the upper echelon of society gathered. These are kind of like our kind of folks, you know, just normal, hardworking folks. And uh, we need more normal, hardworking folks in America and less bums and mo moochers, I'd say. I, we got so many people taken off the, taken, skimming off the top and taken from the system. I mean, we've got attorneys that advertise, you know, get in a wreck, need a check. And there's people, jubilation, jumping around how they got a disability check. And I'm thinking, how disabled are you, you know? These were hardworking people, just the common people. And I got off the subject, obviously. The Sea of Galilee is 680 feet below sea level. It's fed by the Jordan River. I had the thrill of a lifetime to be able to speak on the Sea of Galilee, and I spoke on the subject of the storm, and while we were out there, it got 
rough and people were leaning over the side ready to get rid of their breakfast. But I've been there and it's just a pretty little spot. And so Jesus is there. He's on the side of the sea. It's also called Tiberius. Your notes tell you several different names. It's called in Scripture, Geneset, Shinnereth. But Jesus called Peter and Andrew and James and John all here while they were fishing. He called them to be fishers of men. He walked on the water. He calmed the storm here. And at one time, he had them catch 153 fishes. I mean, it says that fish pastor notes fishes. When you talk about more than one species, it's fishes. So they didn't catch 153 fish. They caught 153 sp- fishes. So they caught several varieties of fish. And uh, we know that storytelling, as your notes tell you, was, was a common way to, to uh, explain truth hundreds of years before Jesus. There are documents we have in museums and so forth of people who were storytellers. But only two parables are interpreted, and both are interpreted in great detail. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And the main truth, remember, parables only have one main truth. Even though there's probably a lot of little facts and circumstances in the parable, there's only one main truth in the parable. And the main truth here, you have it, is people respond differently to the gospel for different reasons. Uh, we know, we've already said, explained some of this, but he warns us not to cast pearls before swine in chapter 7, verse 6. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you the mistake a lot of Christians make. We go to work, and we pester a guy who we know has trouble with drinking. We pester him. You need to quit your drinking, and we talk all the time about his drinking. And then we have another guy at work. He's not a Christian either, and we talk to him about you know, uh, how he treats his wife. Folks, you cannot disciple people who are not saved. You can't put the cart before the horse. You're casting pearls before swine. Now, don't tell your coworker I said they're, they're swine. But that's the, that's the point of that verse. Don't cast your pearls before swine. When people have problems, just try to introduce them to Jesus. Say, you know, if they bring up their problem of whatever it is, say, you know, the Lord could really help you. And don't pester them about their lives. Years ago, I was in a grocery store, and I was in there with another student from the college, and he was a guy with a lot of zeal but not a lot of brains. And he complained because the store was playing bad music over the intercom. I don't know what they were playing. I didn't even pay attention. I was busy shopping, but... He went up and complained, and he wanted it changed. And then he shared with some of us, and I said, well, that's dumb. And he, well, what do you mean that's dumb? I'm not going to listen to that music. I said, you're casting your pearls before swine. You're expecting the world to accommodate you and your standards. Well, why don't you go to the beach and tell all the women that are wearing bikinis, you need to dress modestly. That's what the Bible says. You know, folks, we have to do things God's way. I mean, Jesus sat down and ate with the worst of people, and he didn't judge them. They didn't get up and leave because he was offensive. They sat, spent time with him, and learned from Jesus. And so, you know, we have to understand that that Pastor Dan got way off the subject with all that. But uh, i got to get back to the point here. I mentioned casting pearls before swine. I elaborated on that a little longer than I needed to. But the next six parables he told to include, and, and he included the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, we've talked about the kingdom of heaven a lot, and I'm going to explain all that tonight a little more because you've had questions. And by the way, every Wednesday you can ask a question before I start or after I'm done about anything or specifically about the text, okay? So I'm always open to questions. What about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and and all this, and the millennial kingdom? The millennial kingdom is a thousand-year reign that is going to be an actual physical kingdom on earth. That's future. The Bible tells us in Luke the kingdom of God is within you. And the Bible also tells us that as believers, we're part of the kingdom of God, and we're part of the kingdom of heaven. What is all that? Well, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven... The kingdom of of heaven includes everything God ever made. Heaven, earth, 
fallen angels, good angels, sinners, saints, this planet, the stars, everything. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that only includes believers, angels, the Trinity, and heaven. There's a slight difference. We're part of both because we live in this world, obviously, and we're also saved. But we're already in the spiritual kingdom of God as believers, aren't we? That's clearly taught in Scripture. One day there'll be a millennial, king, millennial kingdom. Don't get the two confused. Jesus offered the literal kingdom, the thousand-year reign to him when he was here, didn't he? He said, go preach, and we've talked about that. We, we, teach, we taught, we teach, great grammar. We taught that, and you learned that Jesus was ready to usher in the kingdom. And of course, being God, he knew they'd reject him, and he knew he'd go to the cross. And I'm thankful that he went to the cross to pay for sin, because that certainly included me. Isaiah said in chapter 6, verse 9, regarding parables, Go and tell these people, but understand not and perceive not. The psalmist in Psalm 78 said that he, opened his, he will open his mouth prophetically and speak in a parable. So Isaiah predicted Jesus would do this a long time ago. Ezekiel 17, 2 calls the Son of Man one who would speak in parables. So it was prophetically stated that he would come and tell these stories. And remember, a parable is not a true story. It includes truth. It applies. It, it's to illustrate truth. But quite, they're identified by those two little words, like and as. So here we find the reason Jesus told the story. And we'll get to our text momentarily. And I, I've only been up here five minutes. It's already 730. So I guess we'll probably be here to eight. I, I talked to my son today about I got to shorten it up. I've been preaching 45 minutes and I'm usually a 35 minute guy. But tonight it's going to be 35 minutes because I just been up here a few minutes. But the reason Jesus told the story, John Walford tells us he told it to show why the Pharisees rejected his message. They were not prepared for the word, for the seed. They were not prepared soil. Now, the Bible tells us in 8.11 that the seed is the word of God. Look at uh, back to chapter 8, verse 11. And you can mark this if you want to. And uh, <clears throat> Luke 8, 11, not Matthew, I apologize. Luke 8, 11 says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. That's the parallel. Now remember at the top of your notes, I'll give you all the places this parable is found. Tonight we're looking at Matthew. Why do we look at Matthew? Because it's the most thorough of the three places. But the parable is also repeated in Mark and Luke. So we go to those passages for little bits and pieces that aren't found in Matthew, and we learn from Luke that the seed is the word of God. The context preceding our text uh, consists of talking about Jesus and the family of Jesus consisting of those who do the will of the Father. And the Pharisees were not part of his family. They were professors, but not possessors. I mean, not possessors. Yeah, I got it right. They were professors, not college professors, but people who professed to know the Lord, but didn't know God. Had they known God, Jesus said clearly, if, if you knew the Father, you really didn't know the Father, you'd admit that I'm the Son of God. That's what Jesus told them. So they were in denial of the fact that he was the Messiah. So that's the reason he told the story. The lesson he's teaching, well, he's, he's, on the, he's on the seashore. The crowds get so big that he has to go out and do a little boat. In Israel, they have a little museum. You can go find one of these boats. They have one of these boats they dug up at the time of Jesus. They're like 15 to 20 feet long, made of wood. And amazing, we, we call them boats. They call, the scripture calls them a ship, but that was a ship to them. It's the biggest thing in the hand. And he had to get out in the boat, in the ship, and, and teach because the crowds just closed in on him. I mean, he had healed people. His reputation was that he was the Messiah, and people were starting to believe. The Bible says many believed just because he would heal. Many believed because of the things he could do for them. But a lot of these believers weren't sincere in their belief. But he sat in the ship and began to speak to the multitude. And he spoke in parables, verse 3 says. He spake many things unto them in parables. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, the words went forth in the grammar of the original language 
indicate the sower may have traveled some distance. And I've heard a lot of preachers preach this and talk about missions, and that's a good application. Because if, if that idea included distance, what does it tell us? Well, what does Mark 16, 15 say? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And it's not just limited to Jerusalem, but you have Judea and Samaria, the outer area and the, the county and the state and then the whole world. And so he says here, this parable, this sower went forth to sow. Now, Verse 37 tells us the field is the world, and that's part of the interpretation, where it simply says what I just quoted, the field is the world. Um, the seed, he that sows seed is the son of man, and then I think it might be 47, I might have this wrong, but anyway, it says the seed is, uh, the field is the world, the seed is the word of God. The sower, excuse me, verse 37, was Jesus, the son of man. So this parable is about Jesus. And Jesus is the sower, the field is the world, and the seed is the word of God. He says in Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, that he'll give seed to the sower and it won't return void. So what Jesus would do would not return void. We're given that promise in Isaiah 40, that the word of God will not return void. So even when you witness to somebody or give out a track or invite them to church, even though you think, well, I, I only had one verse or I had a track and I didn't get a lot of time and that, everything you do that involves the Word of God is supernaturally empowered. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. It can discern thoughts and intentions of people. The Bible said it can divide the soul and spirit so I've th threatened to teach in the tabernacle, body, soul, and spirit. That's how powerful the Word of God is. And so um, Jesus is the sower here. And the sower would sow some seed. Luke said the seed is the Word of God. We already told you that Matthew 13, 37 and 38 say the good seed are the children of the kingdom. So God plants a seed in us, and then he plants us in the world. And we need to build the kingdom of God. And really we should specify and say we need to build the church of God by sowing seed and being soul winners like Jesus. Now here I have some types of seed in the Bible. Joel talks about rotten seed. We know there's mingled seed. That's the seed of compromise. Rotten seed is false teachings and so forth. Then there's corruptible seed and incorruptible. And incorruptible is the word of God. Anything else is corruptible. There's not a book on the face of the earth that is not incorruptible. You say, just a simple story, that's right. The only incorruptible book, the only incorruptible word is the Word of God. Amen. It's amazing even, I, I, I love encyclopedias, I love dictionaries. Years ago I'd use those encyclopedias and read about things, now everything's on the internet. And you, you find a mistake or a misspelled word and you think, wow, you know? And they change things. As new information comes in, Stuff in your encyclopedia in the 70s is wrong now. They've come out and said, wrong. Uh, and of course, the Word of God is always right on target. I, uh, one of my pet peeves, and I'm getting off the subject. I just feel like it. I watch the Discovery Channel, and they say, the alligator is 10 million years old. Then I turn over to National Geographic. The alligator is 100 million years old. I think, don't these guys get together? That's 90, years, 90 million years difference. <laughs> well, they don't know. You know why they need a lot of time? This is free. It's not part of your notes. You know why they need a lot of time? You know why they keep saying things are older and older and older? Because for the chance, the random chance that evolution would work for the tadpole to become the professor, you know, or to become the, you know, lion, or to become the fish, for that to happen in all those chances, that random chance they call it, that selection process would take just billions and billions of years for it to happen. Just think about this. The universe and your body are both way more complex than this building. How long would it take for us to take all these materials, let's say they're all in the parking lot, the cloth and the wood, in the concrete and the roof and the PA system and to throw it up in the air for it to come down like this. See, they need time. 
So what that has to do with anything, I don't know. But that's a little tidbit of apologetics, I guess. Anyway, uh, verse 4 reads here, He sowed some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and gathered them up. Fowls in Scripture always speak of the wicked one. You, you know that from verse 19. It talks about the wicked one who catches the way the seed that's sown in the heart. So that's, that's the fowl. That could apply to Satan. Verse 5 says, Some fell on stony places. The ground in Palestine was rocky and full of thorns. And so this had very little soil. So the, the result would be something would spring up quickly and then die. In our parking lot at work, we have a bunch of dirt that's washed down from the hill. It's about that thick. Once in a while, I'll shovel it up. But I leave it there, and things pop up. Things are growing all through that. They don't last because there's not enough room for the root system because there's asphalt under there. So they last for a little while, and they don't get very big, and then they start to die. And so it says here that some were like that. They sprung up quickly. Um, and that word forthwith is translated in 1431 immediately. So they spring up right away because the soil is shallow. Now the word earth here, and I, you've got that, is the word, our word geology. It's translated ground in verse 23. So I always tell you that one Greek word can be translated a bunch of ways. The word exercise in Scripture, trans, there's five different words translated exercise. One of them is gymnasium. You know that one. And there's different ones. But anyway... That's just an illustration. So I'll, I'll always do that because I want you to understand why one passage has it one way. And it's always the context that determines how the translators translate it. And they would choose which one fits the text best. But anyway, verse 6, they were scorched. They withered because they didn't have any root. You know who the root is? Isaiah 11 says, verse 1 says, the root of Jesse and who's the root of Jesse? Jesus, because Jesse was David's father, and Jesus came from the seed of the line of David, both through Solomon and Nathan. You follow the line of Solomon down to the Lord, and you got a problem, because in the middle of that lineage, you got a guy named Jeconiah. The New Testament calls him Coniah, the Old Testament Jeconiah, and the lineage is given in Matthew. On Nathan's side, it's a more pure line, but Nathan goes down to Mary. Joseph go, uh, Solomon goes down to Joseph. And there's a promise in Scripture that no one from the seed of Jeconiah would ever sit on the throne of Israel. So Jesus would be ruled out as king because of Coniah's sin. Remember, both Solomon and Nathan come from David, so those lines go down. So where did Jesus get the throne from? from Mary and the virgin birth. So even genealogies in your matter can be very, in your Bible can, can matter and be very deep. Just a teaching of a simple genealogical line. And I'm going too fast. So all those things matter. We talk about name meanings, genealogies. There's so much truth in Scripture. But they didn't have Jesus. Some, verse 7, fell among thorns. These thorns choked them. But verse 8 says, some fell on good ground and produced a lot of fruit. Now go over to verses 18 to 23. And you have your notes, so uh, when I ramble, you don't need to write it down, you have most of it notes. But here in verses 18 and following, the Lord interprets the parable. He says here in verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth it away, that which is, was sown in his heart, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. So the first person, he hears it, he's taken it in, but he can't remember it. The devil just causes him to forget. People will come to this church who are lost, and we will preach. I'm very hot tonight, I don't know why. We will preach to them, and they'll understand the gospel for a few moments during church. Then they'll get in their car and go home, turn the television on, and the next day they'll think, I wonder, how was it that guy said we had to be saved again? Why is that? Because the devil snatches that seed. And so uh, the wicked one we know is this evil Satan, and it's translated evil in 613. This is Satan who catches the seed away. 
These words catch away are translated rob in Philippians 2.6 and plucked out in John 10.28, where it says nothing can pluck you out of the hand of God, out of the hand of God. This person may have intellectual, intellectually, listen, intellectually listened, but they didn't experience the Lord. And there are people who understand the gospel here for a little while, until Satan snatches it away, but there's 18 inches between here and here. The inner man, we don't really know exactly where the inner man is, but in the Bible that we've said Sunday talks about it. He's in our bowels, he's in our heart. He's in there. But when you get saved, he takes up residence. But a lot of people know this. I'm sure that in this area, there's a lot of people that intellectually can tell you, I got saved, here's how I got saved. And they may not be saved at all because they may not have experienced the Lord. In verse 20, we have the second one who hear, hears the word. The word anon means it once, and he receives it. The quick response is like the easy believism of today. The person heard but didn't experience. They didn't obey. And so the stony ground, which had no root, that's what this is referring to. Some hear enough to be entertained, to say, I went to church. Some are raised in church. They go to church, but they haven't experienced the Lord. And the word tribulation here talks about stress and means stress and being crushed. They can't handle the pressure brought on by the truth. They're offended. Let's read the verse. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and on with joy receiveth it, yet he hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, it says because of the word, by and by he is what? Offended. That is the word scandal on. We, uh, it, it's, it's the word we get our word scandal from. It's a spiritual scandal. They hear the word, but a scandal. They can't handle the truth. And uh, the, the Bible teaches here it's a scandal. They, they lose this opportunity. They're offended. The third person hears and obeys, but quickly gives up. They're like the emotional responders who are temporarily sincere. You'll have people come forward emotionally, and emotion's good, but emotion's not necessarily a sign of the Holy Spirit. There have been plenty of people say amen in the flesh. We all have experienced being in church where someone has said amen sarcastically during a business meeting or during an announcement they thought was a good announcement targeted at someone, amen. We don't need these uh, children running around with Jane, man. And they're referring to someone whose children run around. Let me just say this to you. I'd love to have a lot of children running around here. <laughs> Amen. And Jesus would too. He said, don't hinder them from coming to me. Children are the most important part of the church because they have an entire life to live for God. You know, and I love to see, we had a couple of babies Sunday. I, I know George, they, well, I'm not going to get into all that, but I just think it's awesome, and, and to have kids in church, they're more important than we are because they have so much to give to God. So here's a person, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth. Mark adds the lust of other things causes them to, to be unfruitful. Many believers find themselves in this state. They were probably sincere in, in their decision, but they don't last. I know so many people like that that said they came to know Christ, they were sincere. I, at times, I was even there with them. I've told people about Jesus, and they prayed a prayer, and they've cried and broken down and, and shared their story, and then five years later, they're not in church. While they were saved, they've gotten out now. They don't lose their salvation if they're truly born again. We know that. But the cares of the world, the deceit of the world. But the fourth believer, in verse 23 we have the humble, obedient doer of the word. This, this is a believer who's a continual doer. He hears the word, logos, understands the cost involved, and, he, and, and his, he's got the fertile soil. He, he's ready for God. You know, the, the, the most important thing to have fertile soil? You know, you, you go out and you, if you go out and you just plant seed, things oftentimes don't grow. And I've learned that. I'm not a green thumb. You get what's called a tiller. I mean, most of you know what that is. I had a friend named Ralph Tiller, by the way, but he wasn't a tiller in that regard. Ralph it was just a person. But a tiller will what? Tear up that soil. Loosen it up. The Spirit of God does a work on the sinner's heart. 
tears them apart, and they become fertile and ready for the seed of the gospel. And the evidence of that is when they are ready to repent, they're realizing they're a sinner, the soil's been churned up by the Holy Spirit, they're now ready for the seed. And if the seed is planted, and they receive it with joy, they're going to produce some fruit. And so that, that's the teaching here, the responses to the Word of God. Now, the application to your life. Read verse 9 and explain what it means to you. Verse 9, who would like to read that out loud for us? Simple verse. Who hath ears, let him hear. It means listen. In Revelation, the message to the churches in Revelation, the seven churches. Revelation 2, 7, 11, 19, 29, 3, 6, 13, and 22. It says, he that hath ears, let him hear. Says it to all seven of those churches. In other words, listen, listen. That's what Jesus said. He said, listen to what I've just said. Everyone responds differently. That's why I'm careful when I witness to somebody and they make a profession. I don't just run up to church that Sunday and say, I led this guy to the Lord today, because you know what? At least three-fourths of the time, <laughs> I never see that guy in church. They don't get baptized. Maybe sometimes they get baptized. That's like the guy who gets saved but doesn't, and then the world comes in and he's out of church. But only one in four of the text, I'm not saying it's one in four in all cases, but the text teaches one in four people get saved and live it. Two in four people get saved, and the other two aren't even saved. And that's what the text teaches. So when you witness to people, don't be dis discouraged and disappointed when they pray a prayer and receive Christ and they never get baptized, they never come to church, they don't take your phone calls, they avoid you at work. The world can just pull them away. And so Jesus is teaching us so we understand that people respond to the gospel differently and that they make choices and sometimes they choose the world. And then I have a question here that you can answer later. Is your profession authentic? Explain it. And then in uh, verse, chapter, Luke 18, verse A, um, he says here in Luke's account, look at Luke 8, 18A. I have it right on the paper, but I just didn't read it right. Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Take heed therefore how ye hear, a lot of people don't listen carefully. I am a little ADD, and as you get to know me more, you'll, you'll know that I am. You can sometimes see my eyes shifting to three or four ideas while we're having a conversation, because I got so many things flowing in my head. I mean, I could not concentrate all the way through elementary school. They talked about holding me back all the time. Even college was tough. I couldn't study more than 10 minutes. My mind was way out there. Even my preaching, I'm way out there sometimes. Thoughts come in, I'm going 100 miles an hour. And so I have to take heed how I listen sometimes. Because communication breakdowns in churches and in marriages and in workplaces, that's a big problem. When you have a problem in any relationship of yours, you know what it is? It's a communication problem. Because two well-intending, well-meaning people can have a big problem in the relationship because they don't communicate well. Listening is the most important. God gave you two ears and only one big mouth. He wants us to listen. So don't just listen, but Take heed how you listen. Be a good listener. There's been times I've had people come for counseling or something, and me and all my know-it-all ways, I'll just hear one sentence, and I'll evaluate their marriage and give them all kinds of information, and they find out that they had nothing to do with their marriage. It wasn't at all their problem. You know what the problem was? Me. I didn't what? Listen. So we have to listen and um, the next question, will you allow God to plant you somewhere? Uh, have you counted the cost of following Jesus? Explain what the cost may be. Then I ask, can a believer who sows little seed or sows the wrong kind of seed be of great or positive influence? No. 
That, that's the problem with the cults. They, they sow rotten seed. And if you sow rotten seed and you don't sow the seed of the word of God, it's not going to be effective. But back up. Have you counted the cost? Explain what the cost may be. One of the greatest problems in ministry, now I'm so blessed. Let me say, I want to say this ahead of time. My grandparents were Christians. My parents were Christians. All seven of my siblings, all of us were Christians. All my kids are Christians. All my grandkids that are old enough to understand have come to know Christ. My uncles and aunts, my cousins, it's ridiculous. So when I preached at South Baptist Church, a big massive church in Lansing, when I would preach there, they would say, I would like, the, one of the preachers would say, I'd like for anybody related to Dan to stand up. And this big mass of people would stand and everybody would cheer because I have that great support. But unfortunately, it's not that way all the time. I don't have a single relative that's ever discouraged me from attending a church or preaching at a church or ministering to the church. They're all always, yes. Some of them are watching our podcast, Brother Mike, now. Not now, but I mean, this, you know, looking at it and watching our videos. I have a great support team, but not every preacher or every witness does. What could it cost you is the question. It could cost you parents, siblings, your life. My boys, Zach told me one time about China. He said, Dad, sometimes in church, a Chinese person will stand up and start crying and say, thank you for telling me about Jesus, and they're sobbing. You see, they have to count the cost. You know, in China, it could be dangerous if someone found out this person's a born-again Christian. It, it, it may cost you a job, it may cost you finances, it may take your health, counting the cost. I do not like, and I'm going to close with this, I do not like it when people witness and they tell the person who's thinking about being saved, it's the greatest life. If you get saved, all your problems are going away. You're going to have all kinds of money. I'm thinking, that's a lie. Stop that. Tell them to count the cost. Because it's not easy being a Christian. I became a Christian. I was 12. I was in, I think, Middle school, was it sixth grade? I don't remember. Whatever that goes with, I never got held back. Should have, but so that, that, I was 12. And I'm telling you, at junior high, I was picked on, belittled, called a holy roller. A girl I had a crush on came to our church when I was like in eighth grade. She never spoke to me again. She said to everybody, he's a holy roller. And I was glad to be an athlete because that took a little pressure off me, but I had... Christian friends that I knew were Christian. We didn't even hardly ever speak to each other in the school we were at. We, back in our day, we did a lot of fighting. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you could get punched in school. I was careful when I took a drink. Who's going to shove my face down into the fountain and who am I going to punch? That's kind of how it was. I played in basketball games that never ended because riots broke out and at times my brothers and I were involved in the fights. It was not good. And the persecution when you came to know the Lord was pretty intense in those days. So I lost some friends because I was a holy roller, you know. Now as you mature and you become, a, you become more and more like a soldier, you're willing to stand up and say, you know, I know what I have is real. You have a problem because you don't have the Lord. And you don't need to defend it like that. I'm really sharing something I shouldn't share. But... You know, you want to say, aha, look at your life now. Because I have so many of those people that I went to high school with that are just out of it now. Out of it. I mean, just terrible things that's, that have happened to them. So folks, count the cost. And when you witness, be totally transparent with people. And say, you know, if you come to know the Lord, your mom and dad may not accept it. Or you may have persecution at work. But I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God.